up, party people? Bobo here with Brass Real Brothers. Thanks for coming back for some more hot, fresh popcorn. <laughs> Joining me in another episode, part three of James Bond Never Dies. Hope y'all had a great Thanksgiving. I know I did. That's why I was off for a couple days, spending it with some family. Well, I'm back to kick off part three with Roger Moore. For this episode, I'm calling More Bond. All right, so here we go. Personally, old Roger, man, I kind of like to refer to him as old Grandpa Jimmy Bond. He was just always way too old for me. He reminded me of my grandpa. Like, literally actually looked a little bit like my grandpa. And it's not that I don't enjoy his movies, because I do. He actually did more movies than anybody else, at least consecutively in this James Bond universe that MGM UA has set out. We had the Never Say Never Again James Bond movie with Sean Connery that came out in the 80s way after he was done with Bond. It was made by Warner Brothers, and it was actually competing against the current James Bond movie being put out by MGM UA, Octopussy. which is the Roger Moore movie I'm gonna be covering. But yeah, Roger Moore did more movies than any other actor as Bond in that consecutive series. Live and Let Die, Man with the Golden Gun, The Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker, which both of those had jaws in them, I love those. For Your Eyes Only, Octopussy, and A View to a Kill, which had Christopher Walken in it. But one of the reasons I could just never buy him as James Bond is what I've already said. He just looked too old for the part. I didn't believe it. When he was doing fight scenes, he was behaving like a grandpa, moving like a grandpa. When he was making out with the girls, oh my God, what's up with the way he kissed those girls? I mean, even as a kid, I knew that wasn't the way he kissed girls. No, come here, sweetheart. Give old gramps a kiss. Anytime he was firing a gun or anything like that, he just looked like an old man firing a gun. Like I said, I just never bought him as Bond. But that doesn't mean I dislike him either. I enjoy these movies for what they were because every actor was either a representation of either the decade or sort of the era of that period. What was trendy in that period? Because sometimes decades bleed more like from the middle of the decade to the middle of the next decade rather than the beginning of one to the end of the other, if that makes sense. Sean Connery set the tone for the character. You know, the just whole debonair, smooth, sly secret agent guy. George Lazenby didn't really do anything but kind of his just own little thing. He kind of just portrayed himself. But when Roger Moore came in, he did try to be like Sean Connery, but it just came off as something that was very goofy to me. In fact, all the movies themselves come off pretty goofy, but that's kind of why I like them. They started implementing all that over-the-top stuff with just really ridiculous gadgets, ridiculous vehicles, ridiculous gadgets on the vehicles. They started doing some more reoccurring characters, but kind of like comedically. Like as much as I love Jaws and the spy who loved me in Moonraker and I love his whole character in general, it was slightly comedic. And then you got that reoccurring sheriff guy and live and let die and man with a golden gun. Got a set of wheels, you just won't quit, boy. What the? To me, that takes me out of the Bond experience. Not so much Jaws, but that reoccurring country sheriff guy definitely takes me out of the Bond experience. And some of the people like that. I was actually even discussing this with my cousin just this weekend over Thanksgiving. He loved those parts of the movie. And you know, these movies have something for everybody. Everybody likes these movies for different reasons. And I respect that. And while Lazy Me was doing his own things, he was sort of maintaining continuity that we were already involved with with Connery. This one, they completely went meta with the character. They kind of started over again. They don't connect any of these movies or try to connect any of these movies really to anything else in the past. They do a little bit with the Blofeld character for a second. I think that's at the beginning of For Your Eyes Only. You don't even see Blofeld's face. You just see that he's bald and in a wheelchair. And in the Roger Moore movies, there were a lot of big name actors that were really cool at the time. Like Christopher Lee was the villain in Man with the Golden Gun. Christopher Walken was a villain in View to a Kill. That also has Benicio Del Toro in one of them. But all the characters were a lot more comic booky in the Roger Moore movies. I mean, the movies themselves were just more comic booky. They weren't so much as action films as they were just sort of over the top. And like I said, at this point, the action scenes don't come off as well as they did in the first six movies. They're still fun, definitely a side of the 80s. They just aren't as good to me. But this one, Octopussy, it was probably the most realistic in tone and plot of all of the Roger Moore films. I find this one the most respectable one to watch out of all the Roger Moore movies, but even then, it's still a Roger Moore Bond. <laughs> It still has a ton of stuff in there where you're just like, oh my. What are you making, a kid's movie? <laughs> and these movies were kind of, you know, silly and goofy feeling, and a lot of that has to do with the director. But I found out something when I was researching all these. I knew that these movies had some directors that were coming back and reoccurring, but I didn't realize that pretty much until the Pierce Brosnan days, 
all the movies were helmed between five directors and they would swap back and forth. Sometimes they do like two in a row. Another director would come and do two in a row. Sometimes they'd grab one of the past directors to come in for one and then go away, but they would always switch around. But the directors they switched between were Terrence Young, Guy Hamilton, who I think is the best out of them all, Lewis Gilbert, Peter Hunt did the Lazenby one, and the guy that did the most of the Roger Moore movies, John Glenn, the astronaut. <laughs> I keep, I keep. No, that guy actually had worked on eight Bond films total and directed five of them. But he didn't just do Roger Morrowinds. He did some with Timothy Dalton as well. But between those five directors, really four because Peter Hunt only did one movie. They pretty much just tossed up the Bond films between those guys until Pierce Brosnan came in and then they started grabbing new talent and switching the movies up and just switching gears completely. But Octopussy is the most believable one. It's the most grounded one out of all the Roger Moore films. You know, it's got all the tropes. It's got this opening scene with this horse plane. <laughs> you gotta watch it. You'll see what I'm talking about. I will say that scene is pretty badass though with the little private mini plane flying through the hangar. Of course, you've got an opening intro song like all the other movies. You get Q and M are in the movie, Money Penny's in there. But what pulled me into this movie really actually was the very beginning opening scene where you see this clown running from these two guys that are twins and they're like knife throwers. They have these vests on and obviously there's a clown, these two knife throwers. You kind of put it together there with a circus. But there's this chase scene in the woods that's very like horror film-esque, kind of Friday the 13th-esque. And then there's a part where this clown shows up in this public little event and he had just been stabbed by those two twins and he's like walking with this knife in his back with all these people around and again it pulled me in immediately as a horror movie fan and as a kid I was like oh this Bond movie is kind of serious and the reason the movie's called Octopus is because one of the Bond girls she's got this tattoo of an octopus on her back and the, one of the other Bond girls in it who turns out to be a good girl has a pet octopus and the circus that these guys are ultimately a part of that you see more and more throughout the film is called Octopussy Circus. That's really the main reason the movie's called Octopussy. But there's this whole thing that's going on where there's this Fabergé egg that's being auctioned off and then we find out it's a fake and then we realize that the egg was just a facade for something else. It was a nuclear holocaust event. But outside of the man with the golden gun with Christopher Lee, and View to a Kill with Christopher Walken. The villains in all the Roger Moore movies were a little lackluster to me, especially the two villains in this. I could give two shits about them, honestly. Just that I don't care. I enjoy watching all the Bond stuff a little bit, but again, it's Roger Moore, so I'm not enjoying it all that much. But the plot in this one is actually a little intelligent, and it's not so over the top, it's more grounded. Like I said, that's kind of why I like this one. But it's not my favorite of the Roger Moore ones. I actually rewatched some of the other ones more. But this is the one that like if I had to show to one person out of all the Roger Moore films, I would probably show him this one. And this one is directed by John Glenn. And I'm telling you, if you just look at the direction style of John Glenn's movies, and then look at the direction style of Guy Hamilton's movies, total difference. Even the older Guy Hamilton movies always are way better than the most current John Glenn movies. And I don't know why they were going with that then. I guess it was just working, but I definitely prefer these Bond style films the least. But just like all the other Bond tropes it has, it's got more of it. Like everybody double cross each other, Bond hooking up with girls and kissing them all weird. Ah, still bugs the hell out of me. Gets into some more shenanigans by being hunted by this tribe who all rides elephants and then he swings across all these jungle vines and pulls a Shia LaBeouf. Oh my God! What are you guys doing to me here? I love you Shia, I love you Spielberg, and I love you Indiana, but that scene ruined everything. I didn't say this one wasn't cheeseball at all. I just said it was the most grounded. It's still a Roger Moore Bond. As you can see, I got the little frowny face back there. Hey, no time to die for that. Another thing I just have to point out about this movie is when Bond shows up at this palace at one point, and there's a guy there with like this retractable saw blade on a chain who gets eaten by an alligator, and Roger Moore conveniently has a robot floatable boat alligator that he escapes in. Mm. Maybe I should rethink choosing this one as the Bond movie for Roger Moore. Well, it's too late now. <laughs> yeah, man. The problem with this era of the Bonds is just it was all predictable. These movies weren't trying to do anything that was just really reeling you in. We're talking about a time too where you had movies that were starting to come out like Terminator and Rambo and stuff like that. Movies that were just 
awesome. And for James Bond, you know, you, I feel like you need to keep that up. You need to stay up. You know, you need to keep up with the Joneses. And today they've been doing that. I mean, Skyfall, Skyfall is one of my favorite Bond movies out there. I didn't care for Quantum of Solace too much, but I mean, as far as the Daniel Craig, you know, period, I think they've done a really good job with that. They're keeping up with modern day style of action. But I don't feel like that these Roger Moore movies were keeping up with the modern day style of action that was going on right then and there. You know, Leap the Weapon, Die Hard, I mean, come on. I mean, Roger Moore was in the late 70s as well, but he did a lot of the 80s too. But everything was very predictable about the Roger Moore movies. Nothing was catching you off guard. There was no suspense. There was no tension. You know, at least on Her Majesty's Secret Service, we had that kicker at the end, that zinger that was just like, oh, oh, sh I mean, honestly, all in all, as far as the way these movies felt, they kind of felt like TV shows with really big budgets. It really did feel like TV quality filming, all of it, just the way it looked. It just, my least favorite ones of these, don't get me wrong, they have their place and I love them with all my heart. The final act scene where Bond and that turban guy are on the plane and it's actually two real stuntmen on a real plane. That's pretty impressive for back in the day or honestly for now. Oh, I see y'all on them. But there is something about the Roger Moore movies that feel the cheapest of all the Bond films, which is why I'm ranking Roger Moore, if you haven't guessed it already, number six. Yeah, he's my least favorite Bond. If you've never seen many Roger Moore films and you want to kind of get the crazy, wacky side of Roger Moore, I say watch Moonraker. If you're wanting to watch one of the more higher brow films of Roger Moore, I say watch Octopussy. Well, guys, thanks for tuning in for part three of James Bond Never Dies. Now we're starting to get to the nitty of the gritty. Be sure you tune up for the next video. Timothy Dalton. Ooh, baby. Look for Brass Real Brothers on Facebook. Look for Bobby Williams on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter, Brass Real Bobby at Brass Real. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button so you can help us make it to the top. And as always, if life gives you lemons, make some hot, fresh popcorn.